right? So the growth hormone, right, operates throughout the body. Do, you, do we know anything about the mechanism of why growth hormone specifically makes the thymus regenerate? Um, well, uh, it's, it's, it's probably uh, through a couple different mechanisms. Uh, growth hormone itself uh, uh, may uh, stimulate the, the growth of uh, thymic epithelial cells and IGF-1 as well may stimulate the growth of uh, thymic epithelial cells. I believe there are uh, receptors in the thymus for both of these things. In fact, the thymus may even manufacture some of its own IGF-1 in response to growth hormone. So I think the thymus is built to respond to, to growth hormone. And uh, of course, IGF-1 is a growth factor. And mm -hmm. so one of the really interesting things about growth hormone, which I find very interesting and attractive is that it doesn't just grow the thymus, it tends to grow everything. So as we get older, we, uh, we, we tend to lose stature. In other words, we get smaller, we get shorter. As we get older, we actually shrink. So the little old lady syndrome, you know, comes about is large part because she doesn't have any growth hormone anymore. And she's actually catabolizing her body, uh, in, you know, and, and actually losing substance. So this happens in everybody to one extent or the other, uh, some people more than others. But uh, uh, this entails loss of kidney mass, of lean body mass, of liver mass. And you need, you know, to have kidneys and livers and things like that, or otherwise you wouldn't have them in the first place. So uh, strikingly, growth hormone grows these things back. It builds up muscle. The only thing that it, it, that it erodes is fat. So normally as we get older, we replace muscle and organ substance with fat, which cannot be good. Mm. Uh, and by the way, fat is a great uh, home place for generating senescent cells, which produce inflammatory responses. So growth hormone reverses all of that. Uh, and by the same token, it also regrows the thymus. So uh, the, the thymus is, is sort of growth hormone uh, uh, starved, you might say, as we get older and older and our growth hormones uh, go down lower and lower and uh, restoring a little bit of what the thymus needs uh, seems to be very salutary, if done in the right way. Interesting. And, and I wanna, I, I should emphasize that it yeah. can be done in the wrong way, right? Right. Uh, and there are crazy people out there who do crazy things and you really don't wanna be one of those. Okay. Yes. And, and growth hormone in general in aging is, is not viewed well. So well, a, growth hormone is not reviewed well for all kinds of reasons, but uh, how much time do you have? You know, we can, <laughs> it's a deep subject and we could go yeah. into it, but, but one reason it's not viewed well is simply that uh, people have not done the right kind of research to justify it. Mm. Uh, and there, there have been people who have abused it and there are people who have done things without really studying what they've done very well. And there's a lot of negative uh, literature out there too about what growth hormone does not do. So I think uh, before now, the case for growth hormone as an aging intervention simply has not really been made. And in our study, it really is the first one that begins to make that case. That is interesting. And I would love to go down that, but I, I think it would, yes, we, we, we would get diverted. Yes. Yes. So you did mention, so one thing you mentioned was that uh, we get smaller as we get old. So in your, in the trial, the trim trial, uh, one person, I, I believe his hair grew uh, like, um, yeah, yeah, from, from gray back to uh, somewhat brown. So yes. did you measure BMI, fat percentage or any other kind of physical traits? And did you see any improvements in them? We, we did not measure that because that has been done over and over and over again. So we already mm -hmm. kind of know that story. It's a given that you're going to lose uh, fat and, and build up lean body mass. Uh, uh, and so we had anecdotal reports of, of people in the trial, uh, you know, telling us that they were getting more buff and things like that. And, that, and even that they were getting stronger. You know, you normally growth hormone, it makes your muscles big, but it doesn't necessarily make your muscles stronger. But if you combine growth hormone and, and testosterone, you tend to get an increase in strength. And since uh, DHEA is an androgen, it seems that uh, that combination, you know, DHEA and, uh, and growth hormone may be able to actually increase strength as well. So some of the guys felt that they were stronger, able to do more intense workouts and things like that, even had the desire, you know, to do more workouts, you know, the, the feeling that I got to, I got to exercise these muscles now. <laughs> so all of that, all of that is good. Um, that's, that's interesting. Um, 
So when you, the, one of the first things you did was checking for safety, right? And you looked for, particularly for uh, signs of prostate cancer, like PSA in the blood markers. Yes. So why particularly prostate cancer? And did you look for other forms of cancer? We uh, were particularly uh, interested in prostate cancer for two reasons. One, uh, the study consisted only of men, so we didn't have to worry about female cancers at all. Uh, but number two, the main reason is that there was a paper in science that I became aware of uh, many years ago, uh, which found that people who uh, have a high uh, level of IGF-1 uh, throughout their lives have a higher risk of cancer, prostate cancer, than the general population. And uh, so we were a little bit worried that if we're going to jack the uh, growth from uh, the IGF-1 levels mm -hmm. up, that we might run into a greater risk. So that was the biggest concern I had going into the trial. So we made sure that we intensively monitored everybody's uh, PSA level, which is a marker of cancer risk. And actually, there's two components to that. There's the absolute level of prostate-specific antigen, or PSA. And then PSA can either exist in a bound form or a free form. And the percentage of it that exists in the free form seems to also be related to prostate cancer risk. So basically you want your percent freeze to be high and you want your percent uh, and your absolute PSAs to be low. So we looked at both of those and we also looked at the ratio of percent free to, to a PSA as a, as a safety factor or the reciprocal as a risk factor. And uh, what was remarkable and exciting to us is that within 15 days, uh, the PSA uh, status actually improved in our guys. And it was statistically significant and it, it stayed improved to the end of the trial. Uh, now PSA can be raised by sexual activity and uh, our treatment may actually increase libido uh, after a while. So we did have some guys coming back to us with uh, PSA scores that look kind of scary at first, but when I told them to knock it off, uh, then the PSA went right back down again. So uh, there did not seem to be any problem with prostate cancer. And then it turned out, you know, that there are other things that happened in the trial that I actually, I have to confess, I was unaware of at the time we designed the trial, but that just fell out of the data. So we're looking at our immune response results and, and seeing what changed and what didn't. And we saw two things that changed that turned out to be really interesting. And one of those is the uh, uh, PD-1 uh, positive CD-8 uh, 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 T cell population. So those, those cells are an exhausted form of T cells and they tend to interfere with uh, the ability of the body to fight cancer. And there are some blockbuster pharmaceuticals out there earning billions of dollars a year that block PD-1 uh, pathway. Uh, and we found, you know, a reduction in these PD-1 positive cells just as a result of making the immune system better, you know, more natural, younger again, uh, without any drug side effects and without any extra cost. So that was kind of cool. That, that suggests that there's kind of a global protection against cancer in, in this protocol. The other thing that we saw, and this part is a bit of a paradox in some ways, but, you know, we, uh, we based the trial at Stanford University. So we had the ability to take ordinary blood samples and measure them in the ordinary way. And we also had the ability to take uh, blood samples and have them processed at Stanford using this technique called CYTOF, which can measure about 40 different uh, immune system markers on a single cell simultaneously. It gives you a tremendous amount of information about what's going on. And based on the CYTOF uh, system, we also saw this change called uh, well, a change in what is called the lymphocyte to monocyte ratio. Hmm. So clinically, the lymphocyte to monocyte ratio, if that is high, you're protected from every form of cancer that has been looked at so far. I think, it, I think the total is like 19 different kinds of cancer that you're protected from if your lymphocyte to monocyte ratio is high. You're also protected against virtually every other disease of age. Uh, you're protected against stroke and inflammation, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and uh, we found that according to the CYTOF measurement, our lymphocyte to monocyte ratio about doubled on average in our guys. So that was pretty exciting as well. Uh, and you know, because of the correlation between lymphocyte to monocyte ratio and cancer, 
it seemed as though our guys might be protected from cancer based on that marker as well. So three different independent ways of thinking that perhaps cancer risk is actually lowered by our treatment, even though going into it, we and everybody else, I think, were worried that giving growth factors might make things worse. Um, at least uh, based on the trim results, we have not seen that. Right, and I did want to talk about the lymphocyte to monocyte ratio, but uh, yeah. so that's really. Good. But there was one aspect of that that uh, you mentioned in in one of your talks that we, you are increasing the number, uh, no, decreasing the number of monocytes. Now, monocytes yes. are, the, are the cells that express CD thirty eight mostly. Exactly. Right? So, exactly. So hopefully we that would help increase our NAD levels. Did, exactly. Did you look for that? Do you have any evidence that it helped? No, we didn't think of that before we did the study because we had no idea that effect was going to occur. That's one of the things that we learned from the study that we had no idea was going to happen before we did the study. So uh, now, of course, we're much more interested in that sort of thing. And uh, we will have to see what we can do uh, as far as monitoring that is concerned. But it turns out to be pretty difficult to monitor NAD. Uh, there are some ways of doing it, but NAD, if you take it out of the body, it's pretty unstable. Uh, degrades in plasma in minutes. Uh, so you have to freeze it. And, you know, the, the, the people I think are still struggling a little bit, although there are assays that are commercially available, at least at one place or maybe two, uh, that, uh, you know, purport to be able to measure NAD. So we may actually uh, do that. Uh, but most of our samples are not frozen. Most of our, well, they're not frozen immediately. They're frozen after they arrive at the, uh, at the blood bank. Uh, and so NAD levels in blood would probably not be very available to us, unfortunately. But this is a story that, that can and needs to be uh, pursued in much greater depth, and we can do that in parallel work. Right. Yeah, it does seem very interesting. So I agree. I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell button for any new video release notifications. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.